Hi, I'm the History Guy, and you can take a trip with me, the History Guy, to our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., March 1st through the 4th, 2024. We've got a great itinerary set up, great hotels and some great meals, but also all sorts of historical sites and government buildings. There's lots of history in Washington, D.C., and you get to do all of that with the History Guy. It is a trip that deserves to be attended and be a great Christmas present for yourself or someone who loves the History Guy. All the details are in the description. The holidays can be particularly difficult for people who are serving their nation, far from home, as it can be for their families who miss their loved ones. During the Second World War, two extraordinary radio broadcasts served to bridge that gap in ways not previously possible and became the precursors to a beloved tradition that is history that deserves to be remembered. The website of the National World War II Museum in New Orleans explains that radio held a special place in the lives of many servicemen and women during and after World War II. The War Department recognized the need for entertainment in an audible link home early in the war. Shortwave radio systems were put in place to inform, educate, and most of all, entertain the troops at home and abroad. If entertainment seems like an odd concern during war, it was actually a vital part of the war effort. The Old Time Radio Catalog website explains that by the end of the First World War, the importance of recreation for the troops was becoming recognized. If morale was allowed to slip, there could be a fatal decline in combat efficiency. While shortwave radio offered an opportunity to bring radio to the troops by the time of the Second World War, there was still a gap. Old Time Radio Catalog continues. Experiments with radio for troop entertainment had been attempted in various overseas locations before World War II with varying degrees of success. The most important improvement needed was to be reliable and desirable content. The idea of developing programming for the Army began before the war. A February 17, 1941 edition of the Virginia Military Institute Cadet reported that a VMI alumnus was to be critical in that role. With the approval of President Roosevelt, the War Department on January 7th announced the appointment of Edward M. Kirby, Director of Public Relations of the National Association of Broadcasters, as expert in broadcasting for the Army on a dollar-a-year basis. The dollar-a-year basis meant that Kirby was essentially being loaned by the NAB, taking a leave of absence while remaining on their payroll. The cadet reports that Mr. Kirby was selected because of his familiarity with the broadcasting shop operations, as well as his military background. The Army organization he was joining, called the Radio Section, was new, with the cadet reporting that the precise organization of the section has not yet been completed. The section was created, however, in recognition of a need driven by the ongoing crisis in Europe. Handling all radio liaison for the department during the current period of non-involvement, the secretary will seek better coordination of relations with radio in fostering recruiting and keeping the public informed. Included in this role was one that would become more important in the coming years. The cadet continues. Program origination in Army cantonments, writing of scripts for recruiting and similar activities, will be cleared through this unit. While the appointment originated during the current period of non-involvement, the vision for the division was not blind to the future. Tune In magazine noted in 1943. Before Pearl Harbor, when only ostriches and those who were blind and would not hear failed to perceive the war clouds then brewing, Kirby went to the Army as a civilian dollar-a-year man to direct the then-new radio branch. After Pearl Harbor, Kirby was commissioned a lieutenant colonel in charge of a division tasked with creating radio content for the morale of American troops. And from his division would come an extraordinary show. Tune in reported that command performance was born of a sports broadcast that Radio Branch cooked up. Boys in the field wanted to know how the baseball games were going, and Colonel Kirby arranged to broadcast the games by shortwave. But the boys in far places then began to write in and ask why, if they could have the sports broadcasts, couldn't they have the good entertainment shows being broadcast in America? The answer would come from Louis Cowan, a producer who had joined the radio branch just before Pearl Harbor. The Library of Congress explains that with the commencement of the war, though, Cowan found his job suddenly changed. Rather than producing shows for civilians, he now found himself charged with creating programs for thousands of new servicemen stationed all around the globe. So he happened upon an idea. 
Many new members of the armed forces were no doubt having to quickly and awkwardly adjust to their new regimented military experience, to the myriad of commands and orders that they now had to obey. What would happen if, instead of taking commands, they were allowed to give them, at least in terms of entertainment? The National World War II Museum explains that in this star-powered variety show, servicemen could request what and who they'd want to hear, requests that became a command for the entertainers. The first episode of Command Performance was broadcast on March 1st, 1942, just sort of three months after Pearl Harbor, emceed by comedian Eddie Cantor. The program promised to be produced this week and every week until it is over, over there. The Library of Congress writes, recorded in front of a live audience, it was sent via shortwave transmission to troops overseas. Installments were also recorded onto 16-inch lacquer-coated discs, the pre-audio tape recording medium of the day, and then pressed onto vinyl transcription discs for eventual shipping overseas. Each subsequent weekly installment had a different host and different lineup of guests, depending on requests. TuneIn explains that by V-mail, letters, cables, requests pour into Washington from American lads serving from Alaska to the Antipodes. The letters themselves provide a magnificent collection of Americana, a cross-section of the soul of America, and a wistful study in nostalgia. Good, bad, or indifferent, these men on foreign soil ask only for the America they left behind. The Library of Congress explains that though often it was a song or a comedy skit that soldiers wanted to hear, sometimes requests were a little more esoteric. Others asked for things even more personal. One soldier wanted to hear the sound of his dog that he had left at home in Indiana. One wanted to hear the foghorns of San Francisco. One wanted to hear the sounds of a nickel slot machine paying off a jackpot. Whatever it was, Cowan and his fellow producers, Vic Knight and Mari Holland, dispatched teams with recorders to capture them. TuneIn writes that one bomber squadron stationed in England had a working arrangement with Judy Garland. She'd sing a song for them in return for each Nazi plane they shot down. To date, Judy owes the boys two songs. And a request that the world's best and worst violinists do a program together found Yasha Heifetz and Jack Benny working as a team. Perhaps the most unusual request was from a sailor at Pearl Harbor. Tune in notes. Would Carol Landis step up to the microphone and just sigh? That's all. She would and did. This was all possible for a simple reason. The Library of Congress notes that from the beginning, to show their support for the troops, performers of all types were generous with their time and talents. And both CBS and NBC donated their studios and recording facilities to the production. Even the major unions and show business guilds relaxed their rules in order to do these shows for the war effort. Old Time Radio Catalog explains the free performances by celebrities became a tradition, as it has been pointed out on numerous occasions, that no career was ever harmed by performing for the troops for free. This donated time and talent made for an extraordinary show. The Library of Congress notes that over the course of the series, a virtual who's who of film, theater, and radio artists appeared on the program. In fact, the show would have been too expensive to produce otherwise. The Indianapolis Times reported in 1942, Estimated to be the costliest radio program in the world, the annual cost would amount to $2,500,000 if the usual fees had to be paid. But this required a very important caveat. The shows could only be broadcast to military personnel. Tune in reported that command performance isn't heard in the United States. It's Uncle Sam's show for men in the armed forces serving abroad. They ask for what they want, and we give it to them. Broadcast on shortwave to troops and distributed via vinyl electrical transcriptions, and after May 1942 broadcast on the newly created Armed Forces Radio Network, command performance was not broadcast over domestic radio stations. The National World War II Museum explains. The key was that it was produced by and for servicemen. All contracts and regulations were based on that fact. So as ubiquitous as command performance was with servicemen, civilian listeners were largely unaware of the show's existence. Except for a single exception. The Indianapolis Times wrote on December 24, 1942, Command performance, the show of stars created at the request of U.S. forces all over the world, will be broadcast to civilians for the first time tonight, on the four major networks. Ordinarily, command performance is recorded by the NBC Recording Division for release only to shortwave channels. However, the home folks this time are going to have a front row seat right along with their boys in the service. 
Aside from being an hour long, as opposed to the usual half hour, the Times explains that tonight's performance will be just like the other 44 shows. The domestic audience merely will be eavesdropping on a show designed for servicemen. The Library of Congress writes that Well Remembered was Command's 1942 Christmas show, a program aired via approval from the networks and unions nationally to civilians for the first time. For this one hour on Christmas Eve, a man and woman you call mom and dad become part of your show. For tonight, for the first time over the four great networks and independent stations, the War Department of the United States of America presents Command Performance. The show was introduced by Elmer Davis, head of the Office of War Information. This Christmas Eve, all over the world, American soldiers, sailors, marines, and nurses are listening to this program as they have listened for almost a year past. But tonight, it serves as a link between them and us at home. We are all hearing it. The whole American people, whether in the cities or on the farms or on the ships at sea or in army camps or at the front. Tonight, because it is Christmas Eve, and a Christmas Eve where a good many American families can't be together as they used to be. Tonight, the War Department has invited us to come together, all of us as listeners, to this program. The show was emceed by one of the most popular hosts of the show, announced as the commanding officer of command performance, comedian Bob Hope. The National World War II Museum writes, The radio show Command Performance was a perfect vehicle for Bob Hope, to whom the idea of performing for those in service was central. By then, Hope was so connected to Command Performance that he began the broadcast saying, How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Bob Command Performance Hope telling all you soldiers, sailors, and marines that although Johnny Doughboy found a rose in Ireland, what he really wants is that stinkweed in Berlin. Variety magazine reported in the December 30th issue. Hope emceed, besides tossing off a monologue and cross-firing with Crosby. Red Skelton did a Christmas morning routine with himself as the boy and Harriet Hilliard as the mother, and it all flowed with pleasant whimsy and infectious comedy. Charles Lawton was braced with Edgar Bergen, and then their stuff fitted into the occasion perfectly. The vocal department was uniformly tops, with Jenny Sims, the Andrews sisters, Crosby, Ethel Waters, and Dinah Shore as the participants. Wright explained that the purpose of the special occasion was to forge, for the evening, a link between the servicemen abroad and the folks on the home front. Ben Gross of the New York Daily News wrote the next day, One of my most generous packages was opened at 11 when for the first time, the public was permitted to hear Command Performance. A year later, Command Performance produced another hour-long Christmas show, again hosted by Bob Hope, but that show was, as with the rest of Command Performance, aired only to the armed forces. But a special Christmas Eve show sponsored by the Office of War Information called Christmas Eve in the Battle Zones aired on December 24th, 1943. The show was similar to the Command Performance Christmas Eve special aired the year before. It was star-studded and broadcast across all domestic networks as well as to service members. But Christmas Eve in the Battle Zones offered a new twist, as it featured broadcasts from the various battle zones to let the loved ones at home know how the American soldiers are spending the eve before Christmas. Journalist Don Keith writes in American Legion magazine in 2018, On that one winter night, all four major radio networks, CBS, NBC Red, NBC Blue, and Mutual, devoted their airwaves to a single program featuring several amateur singers and musicians, along with jokes and sketches. The radio broadcast, Christmas at the Front, gave U.S. audiences a real-time glimpse of soldiers and sailors deployed around the world that that holiday season, and allowed those service members to speak to their folks back home via the fastest-growing mass medium of the day. That was no mean feat. Keith explains, those engineers were attempting something thought impossible only a few years before, bringing live voices from various spots around the world to a single point and broadcasting them to eager listeners at home. The first transatlantic telephone cable was still a decade away. Communication satellites were the stuff of science fiction. This big show depended on relatively new technology and the vagaries of shortwave signal propagation. While the program opened with actor Lionel Barrymore, known for playing Scrooge in Christmas productions of A Christmas Carol, he quickly announced, Now no program of this type would be complete without the presence of a certain young man. His name is synonymous with joy to G.I.s, and he's had that joy of meeting most of them face to face, too. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present the guest conductor of this world tour, Bob Hope, who this time announced himself as Bob Christmas Eve Hope. Broadcasts also included President Roosevelt's fireside chat on the Cairo and Tehran conferences, 
Keith notes that it was an all-star production and likely would have commanded high listenership even without its technical and heart-tugging aspects, but adds, The show was actually the idea of the military, which believed a real-time broadcast would be a tremendous morale boost, not only for the fighting men, but also for their families back home, separated during this holiday season by an awful, globe-spanning war. 1943 was the last show of the type produced for Christmas Eve during the war, although the National World War II Museum notes that in 1944, Armed Forces Radio produced the Christmas Eve show of the Jack Benny program. At the end of the program, Benny took the mic to address all servicemen, offering them a toast, acknowledging that this is war and that the Christmas spirit must seem a very distant thing. Coming during some of the most difficult times of the war, these broadcasts were the product of both technological developments and the situation facing the nation and, of course, the world at the time. To be sure, these broadcasts were propaganda. They were put out by the Office of War Information in order to bolster morale, both at home and abroad, by emphasizing a message of patriotism and commitment to the cause. But noting that 90% of Americans had access to broadcast radio at the time, Don Keith argues that these historic broadcasts almost certainly met their goal. Families felt a little bit closer on this special night of the year. The United Service Organization opined in 2021 that although Hope's World War II performances won him the adoration of many service members, it arguably wasn't until the mid-20th century when he began regularly hosting his infamous Bob Hope Christmas show. But the iconic entertainer cemented his legendary status among the military and civilian communities alike. Hope did those Christmas specials for 40 years and entertained troops at home and abroad for more than 60 years, hosting his last USO tour in 1990 and his last holiday special in 1994. The tradition of stars entertaining troops during the holidays with the United Service Organization continues today. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy, and if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community at Locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.